today we're going to be making a two-part cake platter or stand. Um, so the tools that you'll need to bring with you to the studio for this are a bucket of water, a sponge. These can be purchased at Home Depot. You'll also need a ruler, a needle tool, a wooden knife tool, a small sponge, some different sizes of ribs. I like these because they're flexible and great for finishing. Um, Mud Tools sells these, or you can get them at High Water Clay. And the different colors of ribs um, indicate different stiffnesses. So you can get a couple different kinds and see what you like to work with. And then I also need a uh, cut wire. And these are calipers. You can get these as well from High Water Clay. You'll need about four and a half pounds to five pounds of uh, clay for the top part of your stand, and then three and a half pounds for the bottom part of your stand. All right, let's get started. All right, so to get started with centering four and a half to five pounds, if that is more than you've typically centered before. Um, there are tricks that you can do to center this much clay. One thing is to start with the cone shape that you see here. Um, this is where you're headed. So if you start with it flat um, or in a bolder, weird square shape, anything that's not round and cone-like, you're kind of making more work for yourself than necessary. So that's where I would start with that. In addition, you want to make sure that your clay is soft. You can push into it easily. If you cannot do that or you have difficulty wedging it because it's so stiff, then you are gonna want to use softer clay. You want to, If you're near the end of your bag, it's gonna pose a challenge for you to center that, particularly if you're fairly new to um, centering or throwing. So that being said, um, when I center this, I'm going to center it in chapters from the top down. So I'm going to get this smaller amount of clay and control first, and then I'm going to center this up into that, and I'll talk about some tips and tricks to do that as we go along. First, we need to seal this down to the wheel. Okay, so we're centering this part here. And to walk you through centering, for those that, again, are new to it and need a little bit of reminder, I'm using the heel of my hand to push away from me. And I'm using the fingers in the back to squeeze toward me. It looks like I'm exerting a lot of pressure, but I'm not. Remember that this clay is soft, so it's easier for me to move around. So I'll show you with one hand, but typically you want to use two hands when centering and you're pushing with this part of both hands. In addition, you lock your arms down to your legs or your splash pan if you use one. So I'm pushing away from me, showing you with one hand, and I'm squeezing in the back with my fingers and you slowly move up that wall of clay. So with two hands, that's gonna look like this. So now we've got this top part in control. It's not quite centered yet because my hand still bounces around or dances in certain areas. But I'm gonna get this in control and then I'm gonna cone the whole thing down and we'll probably cone it back up again one more time. So if I push here away from me with this part of my hand, you can see how that top goes crazy. So the answer to that, to keep it in control, is to stack your hands one above the other as you're pushing that clay. This top hand is just holding the top in place. So I'm not pushing with the top hand. I'm just holding the cone still. Another answer 
is to run your fingers up the back, coming on this side of the camera that looks like this, and that will keep this top in control as you push um, with your hands. And that looks like this. It's really whatever is more comfortable for you. There are a million ways to do things in clay. When I'm coning down, I wanna push from the top. I'm not directly on the top. I'm just off the side. So if you can see my fingers at a little bit of an angle here, and that is with the heel of my hand. Another trick when you're coning down is that you want your hands to talk to each other. You don't want them separated. So if I'm up here and my bottom hand is all the way at the bottom of that cone, there's a lot of twisting that happens in the middle and that's not productive. So you need to bring your top hand up to meet I'm sorry, you need to bring the bottom hand up to meet the top in order to avoid that twisting in the middle there. You'll have a lot more control if you do that. So I'm pushing down and away from me. You can see that cone moving away and slowly pushing down as I go. As I get about halfway down, I'm gonna start pushing in on the side. Now, I am gonna show you what it looks like if you're coning down incorrectly, which means that if you start to see something like this, where you're getting what looks like a Seattle Space Needle, there's gonna be air trapped in here as you get further down. So this is what I meant by saying you don't want your hand directly on the top, but rather a little bit more on the top side. If this were the face of a clock, this part of my hand would be at six o'clock. So before we get too much further up, I need to get this part a little more in control so that this can be flat when I pull it out. So I am actually gonna cone up again and down one more time. I can do that like I normally would from the bottom up. off a lot by scraping them on the rim of my bucket and the reason for that is if you think of this slurry this is what we use to attach handles to attach one piece of clay to another this slip and that creates friction between you and your pot and your hands dry out actually a lot faster with all of that on your on them so I do come in I dunk them in water and scrape them, and then they're wet and clean to help assist with moving that clay around. It also helps that if you think about clean hands, clean tools make for cleaner pots, and in the end, when you begin to concern yourself with craftsmanship, that really makes a difference. Um, once you kind of get the, the basics down for throwing, those nuances come into play. So we're going to talk about pushing this part to where it's centered. So if you can see, my hand does kind of move a little bit. I don't know if the camera picks that up or not, but it's there. Um, so I'm going to straighten this side up by pushing away from me with the heel of my hand. And then I'm pushing down directly on the top. And we're going for a birthday cake shape to start. Now I'm going to start working on getting this plate wider. So for this is a 12 inch 
bat. So this is one of the bats that doesn't hang over the edge of the wheel, but rather comes about a quarter inch in. Um, so for the amount of clay that I'm using here, I'm gonna bring that all the way out to the edge of the bat and then make my rim from there. Um, so that I know that in the end, uh, I'll lose about an inch of clay or a half inch on either side if you're thinking about it in the round so that I know that it'll fit a cake on it um, or a certain size cake. So I like to hold my sponge in, in my hand and the sponge actually has water in it. And that way, I know as I'm pushing down with my fist, I can release that water and it'll help my hand move. So I'm gonna push down and I make kind of a little indention right in the center. And then I'm slowly gonna pull toward myself. Now you'll see, we've got our Seattle Space Needle again. So I wanna just kind of correct that before I go any further. So I'm pushing in on the side, again with the heel of my hand. And then I'm gonna do that again. And I'm gonna to continue to do that until I get all the way out to the edge of the bat. of any kind you really want to compress. So I am actually starting just to the inside of where my rim's gonna be, and I'm compressing toward the center. I'm just slowly pushing down. I do tend to leave these plates a little bit convex in the center. So convex means that there's a mound as opposed to a U shape. So it's got a little bit more clay here and a little bit less here. It's not thin. That is very important for something like this because it's gonna be elevated on the stand and the glaze firing. And so thinking about the heat and how that will still move even after the bisque. So now what we're gonna do is make our rim. So I'm gonna push, if you can see where my finger is, right there at the very bottom, and I'm gonna take my finger and push in and straight up. I usually do that with my sponge, because again, this is a more surface area that will stay wet longer than my finger, which is not porous. Well, it has pores, but you get my gist. Okay, so we take our sponge, push in, and straight up. At this point too, if you haven't noticed, I have slowed my wheel down just a little bit. Okay, so that's what we've got so far. Now what I'm gonna do is pinch this wall up a little bit taller and in order to do that, I need to be very careful of how thin I make this. So plates love to split right here as they're drying and they love to crack right down the center. So you can compress through here really well and then make sure that when you're pinching up here, you're not thinning out this part here. So that's where the floor meets the rim um, because you're gonna find cracks in that area. So I start by making a little indention down at the bottom, and that is underneath that area that I just talked about because the floor actually is, is right there. 
and we take our little ant pinchers and we slowly pinch up this wall. Our ant pinchers are at the same place or a finger's width apart, but no more so up that wall. So they look like this on the wall or this on the wall, but never this. And they move up simultaneously. I also make sure that my hands are connected for control. Some water and you're gonna gently pinch that wall up. As you get to the top, you slowly relax your pinch pressure. What you see me doing here when I do this is I'm squeezing a little water on the inside of the wall so that my finger moves as I pull. So then the next thing that we are gonna do is clean up the outside and compress the inside with a rib. Um, before I do that though, I do want to, I wanna make this edge a little more decorative, I think. So if you watch the cupcake stand videos, I demoed a bunch of different ways that you can think about treating this rim area. So I think I'm gonna just give this kind of a wavy scalloped edge um, and I'll show you how to do that. Your cut wire is gonna go around your fingers, kind of like dental floss to where your thumbs are fairly close together. And with my wheel turning slow, I'm gonna come with the rim in between my thumbs and I'm gonna just wiggle the wire as the wheel spins around. Be brave, young hearts. It's not that scary, it's just clay. So just have your wheel going slow, not Mach 12 with your hair on fire, that's no good. You wanna go about Mach 0.5 and then take a deep breath and go for it. Okay, and then stop your wheel when it's all the way around. And you can use a needle tool to peel that away. So then, this is a little chunkier, this rim, than I would like. So I'm gonna actually throw this a little bit thinner. I learned this trick from a good friend of mine who facets a lot. And when he facets, he throws his rims thinner and they make this edge really interesting. So props, Chuckles McGee. Chuck being his fake name. He goes by Chuckles if you ever meet him. You have to be very gentle at the top here. Okay, so that's kind of brought that edge up a little bit and thinned it out. And then I'm gonna take my chamois and I'm gonna go around with the chamois. So this is a chamois cloth and it's very very stiff you can find a cloth kind of version of this uh, in a car supply section um, i actually went years ago to tandy leather and bought a big sheet of deer hide that i was using for another project with kids and this has made a really great chamois it's squishy and soft um, so if you want to invest in that with your friends they have sales all the time on leathers.
Okay, so that's kind of softened that edge up a little bit and I like it a little bit more. Now we're gonna clean up this exterior. So the wooden knife tool is what you need next. This part, the angled part of the tool is the business end. So we lead with the tip of the tool. We come above the area that we wanna cut. So for me, that's about right here. And the tool is just going straight down. Unless you intend on shaping this to where it's sort of rounded at the edge, in which case you would go in at an angle. I don't wanna do that because I don't wanna lose the surface area for the cake to sit on. So I'm holding this tool like a pencil, coming above the area that I wanna cut, and then slowly letting that tool ride down. I'm not pushing terribly hard. You'll find if you let the tool ride along the surface of the clay, it does the work for you. And by using the angled side toward the project you're working on that the other side pushes that clay away from the wall. If I'm going to undercut that with our needle tool so the needle tool is flat to my bat and I'm just undercutting that ring I cut away and then you can just peel that away. Chop it in half and peel it away. This clay can go back in your bag. You can wedge it up for another awesome project, another awesome day. Okay, we're gonna take our wooden knife tool again, and I'm gonna take the tip of this tool, and I'm gonna make a little guide for my cut wire right at the bottom here. And then this also helps to get some of that excess clay that was left away from your project. And then we're gonna clean this up with our rib. So the flat side of your rib goes toward the pot, but tipped away from you a little bit, otherwise it will chatter. All right, super. Now we're gonna take and compress this and get the water off of the surface here. Um, you know, what, that is in the hope that we don't have water sitting there, which causes cracks as it's drying. So we're gonna tip this away from us just a little bit. I'm starting to the side of the pot and then slowly moving in towards center where I'll stop in the middle. When you're using these tools, you want your tool wet. You can see it shiny, but you don't want it dripping water because that's water that you'll just put right back onto what you're trying to take water off of. So wet, and but not dripping wet. I'll give it one last little kiss with my chamois and I slow down because that rim is uneven and I just let the chamois bounce along the rim so I'm not pushing down I'm just trying to soften up a little bit here right, this is the top of the cake plate we have to undercut it so if you use a splash pan I highly recommend that you take your splash pan off before you attempt to undercut this because your splash pan is gonna put your hands a little higher than this bat and you actually want them level with or below. So you're gonna take your cut wire and then you're gonna make sure that your hands are just a little bit lower and pull towards you. 
And that way you're not cutting off or, or into the bottom of the plate there. You will have to recut this because plates tend to re-adhere themselves, but at least as it's drying, it can move a little bit now. Then the next thing I'm gonna do is take my calipers or a ruler, if you don't have calipers, and I'm gonna measure the distance across on the interior. So for here, that looks to be about nine inches, nine and a quarter inches. Um, that means that I'm gonna make sure that the bottom of my ring is not any larger than that or it won't fit. I don't want the ring for the stand to be super small on the interior, meaning, I'll draw a line for you, I don't want the ring to sit here because if that ring sits here, then that is all of this weight from here to here is pressure pulling down when it's firing. So you want that ring to sit a little bit further toward the rim than toward the middle. It'll, it'll all come together and make a little more sense as we throw this next part. Okay, so we've got our three and a half pounds for our stand. I think we said three and a half to four pounds will be fine. If you have too much, you can always chop it down. If you don't have enough, you're stuck. So if you tend to lose clay, keep that in mind. So we're gonna center this. Okay, so once you get this centered, um, you are going to take a look and see, okay, if I set this here, if this was the interior of my cake stand plate, bringing this back. So, like so, that's how wide that is. Then I know that if I look at this this way, this way, that you're gonna have this much room in between the side of the top of your cake stand. And so that's probably okay, but I actually, uh, for me, I'm gonna bring this out just a little bit wider because I know that as I make pulls, this will get narrower. So you want this to be fairly close to what this measurement is. This measurement from here to here is the measurement of the floor of the top of my stand. If you're looking at it with a ruler, that's fine. You're just taking an idea of, okay, I know that if I've got this nine and a quarter inches and I take a look with this ruler in the center of the disc, I've got this much on either side of my stand. So you want it a little bit wider so that it's more stable as it fires and heats up. To get it wider, it's just like as if you were throwing the plate. You can hold the sponge in your middle hand if that's more comfortable and pull towards you to make this disc a little bit wider. So I'm pretty happy with the width of this. You can always double check yourself. You can see that that definitely fits exactly. By the time I finish throwing this, this outside of the ring will have moved in a little bit and we'll show you that at the end so that you can see it. So we're gonna open this all the way to the bat. So I'm opening very slowly with my index finger of my right hand because I am a right-handed writer. If you're a lefty, just reverse that. This is where a lot of people tend to make a mistake in that they really open the center of their clay too fast with their fingers. So go slow with your hands. Even if your wheel's going at a faster clip around, the slower you move your hands when you're throwing, the more control you'll have. 
Now, if nothing's happening, you're moving too slow. So there is a balance to be struck there. I'm gonna take these two fingers and slowly widen that hole. And you'll see this go off center pretty quickly. That means that you're moving your hands too fast. Now what we're gonna do is widen this. So I'm gonna pull this clay all the way out to about here where I'm making that mark. And so as I pull, because this doesn't have a floor, I need to compress down with my thumb. So I'm pushing down with my left thumb as I pull toward me with my right index and my middle finger. So I'm pulling toward me and pushing down with my thumb. If it goes wobbly on you, then slow your rate of pull toward you. A lot of water is required for this. Your hands will dry out very quickly. And then we wanna clean up the inside so we don't have a lot of unnecessary clay ending up in our wall. So you can take your rib, a stiffer rib is usually the easiest way, and just get rid of that excess clay there. All right, now I'm gonna make this stand a little taller. I, this part at the bottom next to your bat will be attached to the bottom underneath of your cake stand. So this part will be the part that sits on the table. So you're throwing this upside down as well. So that means don't thin the bottom part where the bat is too much because you need a wider part to attach. So same thing as raising up the wall of the cake plate. You pinch the wall up gently and slowly. Another trick that I wanna tell you about to getting objects taller when you're trying to do that um, is to keep your inside hand a little more passive than your outside hand. And then also, if your object, as, as we are learning to throw, things tend to go into a V shape because our inside hand is pushing too much. So if that is happening and you notice that this pot's starting to move outward on you and starting to look like that, come in with your hands and color that back in. Like so. So that looked like this coming in and that moves it back toward the center of the wheel. probably going to be my last pull here. I don't want to make it too thin because I want it to be sturdy. So we're going to kind of give it a little bit of a shape as we go. And I'm pushing in the waist from the outside in and then in the bottom from the inside pushing to the out. So you've noticed that this is now a little bit wider than this down here. That will help it be a little more stable on a table. Yeah, maybe we'll do one more pull. Let's get all of this water away from the edges. And then we'll clean this up with a rib. I do wanna take one last look. We talked about how that, if you can remember, my disc started almost exactly at this measurement. And so now let's look and see how we did. We've got a little bit of room, right? So it'll come fairly close to my wall for, for support and to avoid cracking and also slumping when it's fired. Um, but I've, it's not exactly right at the wall point. So that's what I meant by I will lose a little bit of room as I throw. 
Okay, so now we're gonna clean this up and because the outside of this now is convex, which means that it goes inward, then I'm gonna use this part of my rib to match that shape. The great thing about these ribs is because they're so bendy, they'll kind of wrap around and meet any shape that you want to make for the most part. So you want to do this slowly. give myself just a little bit of a guide with my cut wire or excuse me with my wooden knife tool these plates take a long time to dry and you do not want to rush that process so if you come into the studio and this is too wet to trim or flip on the its right side to trim then do another project that week and let this dry some more I highly recommend that because if you rush something this wide and flat, it's gonna warp and it's gonna crack. 